Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. Story number one, Arms Race, written by British Tea Company. From across the stars, thousands of ships stretched across the battlegrounds as formations were established between Terran and Xeno lines. Having taken a position in the orbit of a shattered planet deep within a gash cloud, the Terrans had the advantage of obscurity on their side as they were able to hide some of their backlines from scans. Judging from the fact that cruisers and destroyers were taking up the majority of the Terran front line, their battleships and dreadnoughts were probably hiding behind, utilizing the gas cloud to their advantage. It wasn't unlike the Terrans to have their heavier vessels in the back, and to pull them up only when the knife fights began. In the prow of every Terran battlecruiser and dreadnought was a weapon known as Bifrost, a gigantic energy weapon which could burn through dreadnought armor like tissue paper. Due to the relatively long charge rates and reload time of these weapons, it made sense for Terran heavy ships to snipe enemy vessels as they approached and to unleash hell upon the other weapons once they got too close. To counter this, the Xenos had altered the schematics of their dreadnoughts to counter the Bifrost. These dreadnoughts, known as shield ships, had the ability to not only boost but to create massive energy barriers around entire armadas, which would provide more than ample protection against the Terran dreaded prow weapons. As demonstrated in the initial stages of the battle, the carefully hidden Terran dreadnoughts and battleships, while hard to detect by strike craft, were ultimately unable to do much damage to the enemy fleet due to the shield ships. Another trump card which was why Xeno engineers were able to use against the Terrans happened to be a weapon called the Repulsor Torpedo. As mid-range combat began, this torpedo was fired straight into the heart of the Terran fleet. Massive anti-gravity wells began to push the Terran fleet, primarily their battleships and dreadnoughts, some of which were in the middle of priming their prow weapons straight into the waiting jaws of the strike craft and torpedo boats. Of course, among the dreadnoughts sent into the bad positions happened to be one stand straight into a perfect spot, having a cloaking device much to the surprise of the Xeno Armada when it decloaked straight in front of their fleet. The results were stellar for the Terrans. This dreadnought was a new secret weapon of the Terran fleet, a massive kilometer-long warship with circling band of drones, each equipped with an experimental laser cannon. The prototype was excelled in knife fights, as the Xenos found the drones circling around their orbit, around the ship's body, countless beams came raining down in the cone of death right in front of the dreadnought. In less than three seconds, over 179 ships met their demise as their Terran fleet regrouped itself right behind their new weapon, cutting straight into the eighth fleet. What should have been a decisive victory against the Terran invaders had turned into a massacre and military flop as the first fleet was utterly annihilated within the span of a minute. The second and third forced to retreat after sustaining 76% casualties. The failure listed here went to command to defend against these extragalactic invaders. The council would have to adapt quicker. Weapons developed today could very well be useless tomorrow. To the Terrans, they continued on with business as usual. A species that had been racing one another for who had the pointiest sticks while they were still using little pointy sticks wasn't one who had to worry about flexibility and battles to come. End of story. Story number two. Programming written by Fork Ufa. Captain Zinvok had several questions, one of which she already knew the answer to. The gainy face of the low-resolution combat simulator that was somehow playing on the menus in the ship's galley appeared to be terrible. Of the 150 members on board the Tull Mech Zup, there were only five Terrans. Their eccentricities vexed her to no end, but the Grand Executor had deemed them a necessity. Of those five, only one knew how to access the subroutines that controlled the menus. This could only be the work of Tech Officer Sully. Tech Officer Sully, would you be so kind as to explain how there came to be a Terran combat simulator displayed on the hollow menus on the ship's galley? For her part, Dana Sully looked proud of herself, but given the captain's grey skin was already turning turquoise, 
with annoyance. She resisted the urge to engage in sarcasm. Well, Captain, it comes down to programming languages. Nonsense. Even systems on your home world would still have compatibility issues with each other, and you expect me to believe that the archaic program from your world is compatible with one of our modern systems that wasn't even designed to run anything remotely similar without a complete rewrite or some unauthorized modifications to our systems. For the most part, you are correct, Captain. However, there are certain features that will always be present in any programming language, namely a limited set of states, an infinite amount of storage, and a transition function. The program in question relies primarily on these features. With only minor adjustments, the program in question can run on nearly any platform. Zinvok was shocked at what she had heard. So, what you are saying is that your species created a combat simulator so basic that anything capable of processing mathematic equations can run it. That, uh, actually explains a lot, and makes total sense for your species, but, uh, that doesn't explain why there is a combat simulator on the galley's hollow menus. Dana let out a sigh. Captain, we've been out here for three weeks, and, uh, with all due respect, Grelian media is boring. I had to find a way for entertaining myself, and of all the systems that I have access to, the galley seemed to be the least disruptive to the experiment with. I was bored, and I wanted to see if I could get the Gret Tech to run Doom. End of story. Story number three. The Sundering, written by Provisional Rebel. The Convocation is the Union seat of power. It is a station dedicated to diplomacy and peace, where every species and government, no matter how small, has to have a voice. At times, this peace has been strained, but it has not been broken since the Sundry, almost one hundred years ago. Since then, where every species has a chair in the Convocation's main hall, there are three empty seats. The first is covered in a black cloth. They were the Calve, and the first to fall as victims of their own hubris. They were an ancient race, with untold mastery over technology. But this mastery bore poison fruit when they created the intelligence, a malevolent artificial intelligence which devastated their society, and whose infiltration was so total by the time it struck that only a pitiful few escaped. It was their final act to devise of a method by which the galaxy could be saved. The second is covered in a blue cloth. They were the Dajj Al, once but rivals and as equally ancient as the Kelv themselves. It was by their industrial might that the Kelv's final plan was to be enacted. Their forge worlds worked tirelessly against the expanding devastation of the intelligence. Their codesmiths fought a battle every bit as desperate as the front lines against the tendrils of the intelligence's subversive influence. Ultimately, they lost this war and suffered much the same fate as the cull. It was their final act to deliver the means of our salvation to the convocation. The third is covered in white. They were the humans. A young and small race who, in the time the galaxy knew them, had proved themselves to be a brave and courageous in the face of overwhelming odds. It was them who had built the Convocation and established the Union to bring peace and stability to a time of petty tyrants. In the end, they were the only species who stood to accept the burden. They were given everything, the full technological knowledge and remaining assets of both the Kalb and the Dutch Ull, and took with them the Sundra back to their home system. The intelligence was as yet unaware of the nature of this device and had hounded the Dutch Owl to the convocation. Its pursuit immediately shifted to the humans upon learning they had been given the device, and the final stages began. For two years, the humans were able to hold out on their home world, the energy signatures of the device building all that while. The intelligence knew it was time was limited, and so it poured more and more of itself into the siege. Until finally, the critical mass was reached and reality tore along the seams. The Sundra was a trap. One which was not just capable of disrupting subspace, but obliterating its very structure on the astronomical scale. 
the intelligence's neural pathways were linked to subspace, and so, with the destruction and so many of its processing power drawn to the region, the intelligence was broken, and its remaining parts were hunted down by combined forces of the galaxy as a whole. The victory was not to be shared by the humans, however. Without subspace, FDL communication and jumps are impossible. They ensured the survival of the galaxy and all of its people, but they would never be able to join them again. It was not their final act, but in their isolation that we will never know what that will be. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon, WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.